Good afternoon and welcome to this live Google Hangout with the Daily Vox. I'm Fernandez Parker and I'm speaking to UCT's Vice Chancellor Max Price. We're here to talk about the statue of Cecil John Rhodes on the campus. That's been the focus of so much news interest lately. And we're also going to be talking about transformation in higher education more generally. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Price. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Fernandez. Um, can you bring us up to speed a little bit about where we are in the process um, that's been going on at the moment? We've seen lots of protests, lots of dialogue, um, lots of people saying that they don't want to have a dialogue. Um, we know that there was a big meeting last night. What's happening right now? Right now, there is a group of students uh, that uh, mostly representing the group that's called them, that call themselves Roads Must Fall. And that group is in the... Uh, main uh, meeting room of the administration block of the university, which is called the Bremner Building. Um, and so they've been there since uh, last Friday evening. Uh, many, they're not, not always the same students. In fact, most of the students are still engaged with their studies, so they go to lectures, they uh, do their tutorials and assignments. And then, so there's a shift, people come and go. But almost all the time, there are uh, 20 to 30 students there, sometimes larger numbers. Last night, I think there were over 100 or more. And they're holding, um, they're calling it the, the, the Knowledge Project. They're, they're talking, lecturers are talking to them. They're reading articles. They're debating. And it's a very vibrant debate. Um, uh, but often uh, white and black students, black students uh, talking about how they feel and why they feel that uh, the institution is racist, or their experience of it is racist. White students, I think, are grappling to understand why it's such a different experience for those students and what they as white students can do, if anything, and where they should be working. So that's what's going on there. Uh, you'd need to talk to the SRC and to those representatives because I'm not in that. Um, I just no, no, have an idea of what's going on. Um, uh, other than that, uh, the, the program of, of, of the process that we've been embarked upon since the protest started involved um, a march last Friday to this administration block. The group at that point, including the SRC, made a demand that uh, the statue must come down and there was no, no willingness to debate it or to consult, they thought it, they argued that it was just a clear issue. Um, we, my response and the response of the executive was that actually many of us agree with you that the, that the statue should come down and if you want we can talk about why, we, why it is we do agree, <clears throat> but let's just say we do agree. However, we think that being a university it's important to follow a process, a process that doesn't just respond to loud voices who feel that they are right. Um, my voice or someone else's voice, but rather that we need to recognize that there are a lot of people who don't agree and that we should firstly use an opportunity which we gave ourselves four weeks and then we've reduced it to three weeks, we gave ourselves three weeks, to engage with everyone and to say this is why we as management and why some many students think that the statue should move um, and also to listen to their arguments, to hear their views and so that's been structured around um, firstly a series of meetings, one of those was the student assembly that was held last night in Jamie Hall, uh, another will be the Senate meeting tomorrow, another this morning was the um, meeting of the non-academic staff that, that, that were invited, there will also be a meeting of the convocation which is people from the alumni of the university, of course most alumni are far outside of Cape Town so this will be only the people who are nearby. And then in addition to that we have uh, set up uh, an email address where any of these members of the university community can send us their views. And what we're going to do is, let me emphasize this is not a vote, it's not a referendum. Because we know that the referendum would reflect the history of the place, it would reflect the fact that most of the alumni, many of the staff, perhaps most of the staff, um, might reflect uh, views from the past where they were quite satisfied to have the statue there and may even want to hold on to it. And that being off campus, they may not appreciate how the students on campus are feeling and how the mood has changed. And um, so, and, and they won't have been around to hear the arguments that are presented. So uh, the purpose of this extended consultation is partly an educative one to say this is why the executive is proposing this and partly to hear the good arguments. And this will all culminate on the 8th of April, where, we call, where we've called a special meeting of the Council of the University.
And the council is the only body that can make a decision about the statute. We, at the council meeting, we will be presenting uh, a summary of these arguments that we've, we've heard and, again, putting forward our own view. So that's where we're at at the moment. So it's still ongoing because I, I feel like the news reports this morning seem to imply that actually this had been decided and now it was just a question of whether the arts and culture department was going to give it the go-ahead. That was sort of the impression that we've been getting. Uh, you're saying that actually there's a much broader debate that still needs to be had and it's still ongoing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't think I've seen those news reports, but um, it should be made clear that only the council will be able to decide and that will be on the 8th of April. I, I suppose what the news media might be picking up is that there are relatively few voices that are arguing against the removal of the statue and uh, given that one might anticipate uh, how it will go but it is going to be a council decision and that council hasn't met yet. What are some of the options for what to do with the statue should it be decided that it must come down? I mean they're not exactly just going to blow it up as people on Twitter have been talking about. Um, what are some of the things that might happen to it? Um, there, there are, there is a, I'll, I'll sort of try to reflect a spectrum of views. Of course, there's one view which says not that we should leave it where it is, but turn it around and have it face not the continent, but the university itself. And the argument in that, that group is a group that says what Cecil jo John Rhodes wanted was a university that would be for white people primarily, that would reflect um, a, a, a colonial um, enterprise, a colonial project that he had driven and look what he got, look what his land and his money has achieved. It's achieved a university which is uh, you know, predominantly black, which is uh, filled with, with students from all over the country and the continent, which is, is transforming, not yet transformed but transforming, which represents such different values that one might say it's the victory over what he wanted. So that's one view. Another is that um, at the other extreme is that it should be auctioned off and that money should be raised and the money should be put into the university, maybe into student financial aid. Excuse me. <coughs> um, then there's a view <coughs> that it should be put in, that it should be removed from the campus, uh, possibly put in a museum or anywhere else, but just off campus so that students do not have to confront the statue. Students who find it hateful and, and um, makes them angry would not ever have to confront the statue. Another view uh, is that it should be moved on the campus but perhaps put into a museum on the campus where it's sort of hidden uh, and you'd have to go and find it if you wanted it to find it but it would be on the campus. And then I think probably it's hard to know where the predominant feeling is but I think uh, the other view and my feeling is that there's a lot of support for this is that it should be on the campus but that it's and, not, and definitely not where it is, uh, not in a pride of place, not in a place that's prominent, but in a place which can be constructed as a sort of educative space, a space of memory, a space where other statues, other um, narratives can speak back to the statue, um, and it and 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 it would not be. It's important to say it would not be to balance it with statues of other heroes, say. Mandela or Walter Sisulu or others because that would imply that they were somehow equals and that they were both or all men of virtue or people of virtue and that this is one that reflects one history and this one reflects another history. That's definitely not what we would want to do. I don't think anyone would support that because they're not equals. Rather the speaking back to the statue might be in the form of let's say something that commemorates the, um, the land legislation that removed indigenous or people from the land, uh, local people from the land and made them landless through legislation and when Rhodes was Prime Minister. Or it might be through a sculpture or something that represents the taxation system that was implemented which resulted in people being forced down the mines at very low, pay, low wages or the deaths on the mines from the conditions of mining. Or it might reflect the wars in Zimbabwe, in what is now Zimbabwe, um, which under Cecil John Rhodes uh, resulted in the massacre of, of, of thousands and thousands of the Ndebele uh, who faced machine guns, the new technology of war was the machine gun. So these are things one could do which would say this is what the real Rhodes was like and yes he did give the land and he was a philanthropist and he did support education but this is what that was built on 
and it can be uh, and and so those are some of the things uh, and I would personally at the moment favor the last one okay now um, the statue as we know has been um, sort of a catalyst or a rallying point for people to speak about it's not just about the statue they actually want to speak about transformation as a whole at the university so what happens after the statue comes down I mean where do we take it from there what happens with the transformation process and UCT has come in for a lot of flack lately talking about slow pace of transformation and a lack of black academics professors um, and so forth so where do we go after the statue comes down after April 8th or whichever data set aside to either take it down or move it or you know rearrange it in some way where does this conversation and all of this strong feeling that these students have uh, where does it go to? Well, I certainly hope we can channel, channel it uh, very constructively. The 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 energy, the um, yeah, you know, the passion, uh, I think, will give a boost to transformation. Uh, it it raises it so that it's not business as usual. It's not just one of the things on the agenda amongst many other things that the university does and has to do. Um, it it foregrounds it, and I think it focuses the attention then of the whole UCT community so people can't just ignore it because they don't feel it affects them it does affect them so I certainly hope and I personally would be committed not only to uh, yeah, to, to listening that's the first step of this I think it's to listen and to hear uh, the pain and the uh, frustration that people are expressing and feeling and uh, not to assume we have the answers or that we know what to do about it but to listen to what um, others think sh can be done and should be done. Some of it um, can be, I think, accelerated. Some of it can be accelerated quite, uh, quite easily. So I think the review of the other statues, other names of buildings, other symbols, is something that we can probably commit to quite a tight time frame. Just as we committed to a very tight time frame for the statue, we could commit to a time frame. Uh, around that longer view and, and I hope we could do that uh, over the rest of this year. Um, other things and there are other areas where I think we actually are making good progress but perhaps we don't talk about it enough and we need to bring uh, people into the same debate so that they know um, what the uh, um, uh, what, what is happening. So for example in, in uh, efforts to um, promote success of students uh, in, at university to promote the pass rates and the graduation rates, efforts to uh, recruit people who might otherwise uh, financial who need financial aid, where I think UST has been enormously successful. So we must also recognise what we're achieving and and then find out whether there are still shortcomings. I think the big issue which we are which we're coming in for a lot of criticism is especially around staff transformation and academic staff in particular. Um, and and there's no denying and I don't deny that uh, we've got a long way to go and that it's it's much slower than any of us would like. I think we've got to have discussions um, and draw those uh, critical groups into the process more closely. For example, I personally think that a lot of the problem is is a structural one which is outside of the University of Cape Town. Um, the number of black professors in the country as a whole, South African black professors, very small, 10% of all professors in the in the soul of South Africa are black African uh, South African professors South African born now that's a real constraint um, if people feel that there are additional discriminatory practices in UST that are working against them in other words if there's been a breakdown in trust between maybe young black academics or uh, black staff more generally or the students and our selection committees which are responsible for recruitment then I want to find ways of rebuilding that trust by including them into those committees whether they're promotions committees or, or, or recruitment committees so that together we can see are we really missing someone out there who we could recruit um, and and or is the committee in some way biased against uh, against some applicants my own view is that there isn't much of that sort of bias. I think that it's the structural and uh, the size of the pool, um, and so. But 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 clearly there is a, a breakdown of trust, and the first thing we need to do is to build it up by bringing people into those processes. Because I believe that it is a very much about the pool, 
the next question is, well, is there, can we increase that pool and what can we do? That is a longer process because it's about more people from those, from uh, black, black uh, graduate students and women graduate students getting PhDs, doing postdocs, uh, getting international experience, um, being supported in their, with research grants to strengthen their research profile and climbing the academic ladder so that uh, we have a much larger pool. And I, that, that does take longer, it's not going to produce immediate results, but we need to be able to prove that we are committed to doing that and that we're making progress. So you're talking about um, systematic things that can be done to sort of nurture the talent going through the ranks and, and change things over time. Um, but it's been 20 years since democracy and, you know, we haven't seen the kind of results that people have wanted to see and people have complained about the slow rate of transformation. Even if you look at where this whole um, issue arose a couple of weeks ago, uh, it started with one student throwing uh, excrement on the statue. Um, why did it take this one student throwing excrement on the statue? to suddenly make people start talking about this when actually it's been going on for 20 years. Um, I guess that's a two-part question. Why the slow, the slow pace of change? Um, like, why don't we have these things already? Why haven't we been nurturing them, you know, since 1994, 1995? And why is the university on the back foot? Uh, why did it take one angry student to get everybody talking with so much urgency now? Um, so why has it taken? Why has it taken so long? And, and what's been happening over twenty years? Um, I don't think we've been stagnant for twenty years. And again, without wanting to repeat myself, I, I gave ex many examples of um, student transformation, the student body. Uh, some faculties have undertaken some significant curriculum transformation. The focus of research is very much on the issues that are challenges for South Africa and are. Ch are, are addressing the issues of poverty and inequality. Uh, these are all dimensions of, of transformation. And with respect to the symbols, over the last uh, 10 years, 20 years, we have um, changed or uh, used the opportunity to name buildings, new buildings, and rename buildings that didn't have names in ways that reflect competing histories or different histories, the histories of different people on the campus. We commissioned a very large sculpture which stands next to the Jamson Hall called Hurikwaha, which um, picks up on the uh, history and heritage of the Khoisan. We, we have named buildings after struggle heroes like Dalla Omar, First Minister of Justice, Biko, Sissi Ghul, um, A.C. Jordan, um, Neville Alexander, and many more. <coughs> And so um, this didn't just start with a student. There has been a process. Um, and we had sketched out in December, in October last year, we had planned for the symbols and renaming a program for this year. So I think why, uh, but, but a single protest has the power sometimes if it's an idea that whose time has come, if there are a lot of people, if it's a sort of tinderbox, a lot of people feeling that way, feeling that it's going too slow, a single spark can can light a, a flame, a fire, which uh, in some ways, like the Arab Springs and other uh, almost revolutionary activities, um, you have a build-up of, of frustration over a long period of time and then a spark sets it off. It doesn't mean that was, nothing was happening before or that those feelings weren't there before. Um, I'm yeah, sorry, the other part of the question? Sorry, I was going to say you mentioned the Arab Spring just now, but it's kind of a bad example because they had so much action and then actually nothing really changed for them. So it's actually well, not really encouraging to think of it that way. Um, I think that's a good point. In other words, things did change in the sense that governments fell, uh, dictators fell, um, but they were replaced by other dictators and or by the lack of a state. The states failed because um, there wasn't something to replace it. And I think that there is a lesson there. I think that we should be careful that in our revolutionary fervor to change things rapidly and dramatically, uh, you may destroy the systems, especially within a university, that we think are the core values of a university, which is space to debate, spa uh, protection of people's right to hear other views. And it's really why I've been hanging on, and the university leadership has been hanging on to this view that Although we agree with the demand of the students that the statue should fall, if we simply succumb to that without 
respecting these core values of the university, we would have no defense against a new demand from a new group which might be equally vocal, feel equally justified, but in this case might not be so justified, to simply follow what they demanded. So I think it's important not to destroy the systems of governance and, to, and not to destroy the um, space for managing this in a um, in a in a in a in a, in a in a way that uh, takes account of the urgency but also respects the systems of change management and change. Uh, one of our young students. Sorry, I'm sorry. Like no, I, I didn't get your question. One of our young students has been following this uh, this issue in Cape Town. She's asked. She said that at various points in the student rallies, you've had to wait for permission to speak from the students, and um, there have been times when they've actually just not given you the opportunity to speak. Uh, and this happened at uh, the Bremner sit-in that was going on on Wednesday. Um, how do you understand this move from students not to let you speak? How do you interpret that? No, I'm not sure about the last example because I've not been to the Bremner group before and um, I've not tried to engage up until now and so they haven't den denied me that. Um, the two opportunities, the main, I mean, the main time that that happened was at the protest that happened outside Bremner last Friday afternoon, there was a march. Um, actually, I felt that they did give me a chance to uh, speak when, when, when some of them didn't like what I was saying, they shouted me down. And this happens in rallies and in political protests. I don't feel good about it because I think it's not how a university should, should work. And if people don't want to hear my views, um, I, I think that if they don't want to hear it, that's fine. They don't have to listen to it. The only time I would draw the line is if it's a forum where a whole range of people what do want to hear my views because the right to free speech and the right to academic freedom is a parallel right. It's the right to speak and the right to hear views. Um, and so if the student um, uh, protests resulted in other students being denied their right to hear my views, uh, then I would uh, have a problem. And then we would have to act and I would have to create other fora or other spaces which I was then in control of so that I could be sure that the students could have the, could, could those who wanted to could hear my views. But the protests you're talking about have been student protests, uh, driven by them, managed by them, and in a sense I'm there almost as their guest. And if they don't want to hear me, uh, they, don't, they don't have to listen to me. So they invite me to speak or to respond to the speeches that they have issued, that they've made, and the demands that they've issued. And I uh, try my best to, to respond to that, but if they actually don't want to hear, uh, if, it's, if it's their protest on their terms, then, then I respect that. I'm not going to force my way in. But if it's, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a, 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 something that I've convened or we've convened jointly in order to ensure that other people do hear those views, and I think last night's assembly was much more of the latter. Um, and uh, certainly I was given the opportunity to speak, and I think everyone was who wanted to express their view. I, I actually found the whole protest very interesting. Um, from what I understand, the, the sit-in is almost being supported from various uh, parts of the university. As you said earlier, that there are lecturers coming in and holding seminars and discussions with the students. Apparently there's food being supplied. I heard a rumor that that's being supplied by the university. I don't know if that's true. Maybe you can tell me. So what is the relationship dynamic actually between the students and the university who are in, well, seem to be in opposition, but seem to sort of also be on the same side? Um, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know, I think our, our view is that the students have, in general, behaved uh, with dignity and respected other people's dignity. There hasn't been vandalism. There hasn't been uh, intimidation, and there has been a serious attempt to, firstly, not to ignore their studies either. So it's not these are serious students, uh, these are these are bright students. These are students students who also want to understand and to have their voices heard. So, as a university, we would not want to get in the way of that. Um, we have not, as far as I know, we haven't been providing the food. I think that the students have, uh, I'm pretty sure they've been providing the food themselves. But we have been making the facilities, the bathrooms, the showers. Uh, we've provided a sort of quiet room for those who want to work on their essays and, and assignments. And then we've had, and we've given them actually free reign in the building to, to go, um, actually to go where they want. Because we haven't wanted to escalate this into a confrontation if we could avoid it. 
as I said before, we actually think we are moving in the same direction with respect to the statue. I'm sure there will be other areas where we have very different views, and um, we may have different views about what happens to the statue. But so, so why make a big adversarial standoff when we're not actually disagreeing on the substance of it, um, and where the protest and the method of, of of addressing it has been, you know, reasonably respectful? So. You know, I don't know whether that's necessarily what the students would have liked. Perhaps the students would have, some of them, would have liked a more confrontational approach. Uh, maybe, maybe it's more of a spectacle. But um, we want to try to accommodate uh, the, the 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 protest and the sit-in as far as we can. To get back to the question of transformation at the campus, uh, the university. There is apparently a high degree of churn in terms of black academics at the university. And uh, I read an article that you had on the UCT uh, website a while back saying that uh, every academic, who, every person who leaves the university, uh, an academic, has an exit interview, which is anonymous, in which they can talk about the reason why they've left. Can you tell us what are some of the reasons why these black academics that are being nurtured, um, that are valued by the university, uh, why they're leaving? Yeah, let me say that I don't think that the churn is higher amongst black academics than it is amongst white academics. That's the first point. Um, and it's not very high. Um, it's, it's actually, uh, if you were to compare to other workplaces and to other universities, I think it would be quite low. Um, but <coughs> to come to the substance of the question, which is what are the reasons that people give, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have this at my fingertips, so I don't want to put numbers or proportions on which reasons are more important than other reasons. Let me start by saying some people certainly feel that both the university and Cape Town is, uh, I'm now talking about African, uh, black African acad uh, staff, academics and non-academic staff. They feel that this is not a friendly environment for black African professionals. Um, and I'll just give you an example of one that, one that came into an, in, out of an interview. A uh, black academic who came down from Johannesburg who said, when my child was in school in Johannesburg, um, in a public school, 80% uh, of the class was black African. Um, and they had, and it was easy, they were friends and there were social circles. When they moved to Rondebosch and sent their, chi their child to one of the local schools, also a public school, there were only three African children in the class. Uh, there were lots of colored students, lots of Indian students, lots of white students, but that, the experience for, that, for those children was that all of a sudden from being part of a majority, from being very comfortable, from feeling this is my school, um, those children were feeling like outsiders and like visitors, um, and it had an impact on the family dynamic, uh, or, the, or the, 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 the way that family felt about being here. Similarly, uh, in terms of their social circles, they found that um, the social circles were different and much harder to break into. Now that's, not, that's, a, that's a general issue, but it reflects also, I think, in the university. If you come into university where you have work colleagues, um, that come from, like the same music, go to the same clubs perhaps and movies, um, and uh, have the same history and the same background and you automatically connect with them. Um, compared to going to another work environment where uh, there are very few, or they may not be in your department, they're, because there are so few, they're in other departments, so you don't meet them. So the environment itself is, let me say, an obstacle to that integration, that comfort level, um, and both the environment in the university and the environment um, in some parts of Cape Town. Uh, there's, that's just an example of one set of issues that we get. There is certainly another set which I would say, the, I do think it's the majority, but I would have to verify this, who say that the real factors are pull factors, not push factors from UCT and Cape Town, but pull factors of other jobs and other opportunities. And those factors are going two directions. Um, one is um, there, these, these academics maybe, or the, especially young academics coming up the ranks, um, are uh, in, in, in a hot property, in hot demand by other sectors, the financial services sector, if you come out of accounting or actuarial sciences, um, the engineering sector, um, you know, ESCOM for all of its problems, or SASOL, or uh, uh, Quega. Uh, so there are, there are large industries that do research, and they want good researchers. They want people with PhDs. They're, they're able to pay 
uh, much higher salaries. They attract white and black academics. This is not an, a, an accusation against black academics for being uh, attracted by those opportunities, white academics similarly. But when you have so few black academics, the impact is much greater than it is when you have a relatively large number of white academics. And because those companies are all committed to employment equity and to transforming their own workforce leadership professional groups, um, they are going to be specially uh, keen to recruit uh, these these young and up-and-coming um, graduates, doctoral graduates and academics. There's also a factor which um, is that different universities at, at different levels of research strength may have different criteria for, um, for promotion. At the University of Cape Town, you would need to have a PhD today, not in the past, but today, you would need to have a PhD to get a certain level of job um, at the university, and you would not be able to be promoted to a higher rank, let's say an associate professor or, or a professor, if you didn't have a certain number of publications and a certain strength, a certain reputation as a researcher, raised a certain number of research grants and raised money. So some of these measures are more objective, I hope. Some unfortunately are still a little bit subjective, like the quality of your teaching, which is harder to be objective about. But I'm sure that no one would dispute that other universities, some other universities, have different criteria and, and are not and it's not as competitive or as difficult to get jobs there. And so some academics might choose to go to another university because they can be promoted um, more quickly there than they can here. I don't want and, and the but the ones who are here are undoubtedly they've met every standard you know no one gets promoted if they don't meet the standard and so I can say with confidence that the black academics professors, associate professors, senior researchers are absolutely as competent maybe more competent because they've overcome incredible odds in their personal histories maybe therefore more competent than, than, than maybe white professors or people who were appointed years ago under different criteria the standards have raised they haven't raised they haven't been raised because there are now black academics they've raised because it's become much more competitive the world has changed UST is a globally competitive university we want to be out there with the best and uh, we've you know there are some universities in the country where the average the proportion of academics with PhDs is about 20 to 30 percent at UCT the proportion is above 70 percent so clearly the criteria are going to be different and people will make choices about uh, the pull factors um, that lead. These are challenges and um, I'd, again I don't think we must despair I think we must tackle them amongst other things by making the job more attractive by supplementing it with a more nurturing environment by showing people that there are opportunities through the research funds through conference attendance through perhaps having smaller classes uh, that they've give, get, therefore gives them more time for research we've got to find ways of making this more attractive and I think we've tried lots of things um, not been successful yet but not because we haven't been trying at all we've just got to be, do new things uh Two more questions. The one is, um, there was a report from the event last night when one of the university's uh, lecturers, a sociology lecturer, Darlene Miller, uh, mentioned that she had graduated at the top of her class at Pitts, had worked at three international institutions, studied on a scholarship at John Hopkins University, but she says she's employed on a temporary basis earning 9,000 rand a month. So there is an academic who seems to be quite accomplished. Um, is this person being nurtured to one day, I don't know if she has a PhD, but is someone who is obviously very academically excellent, but why is she only a senior lecturer, uh, a sociology lecturer, why is she on a temporary post? Uh, is she being given the sort of opportunities that you're talking about so that one day we may see her with the PhD being head of department, someone you know very senior? I, I have to say unfortunately that I did not know about her case before last night, I hadn't met. I've never met her before, actually. I don't know how long she's been at the university, um, and uh, so I don't know the circumstances either of why she's on a temporary post or the quality of her CV. Um, and I'll and and as a result of last night's um, lecture, I've I've made inquiries and I'm going to get a report just so that I can answer your question better. <coughs> So, um, but 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 if it if it face if the story is as it is at face value, which is that here is a very talented and accomplished academic who um, wants to make a career at UCT 
Uh, and uh, then I would certainly want to be sure that she has offered every opportunity that she has uh, offered mentoring opportunities if she wants to take advantage of that. Um, we have a program called the Emerging Researchers Program, which is aimed at um, assisting people to write research grants, to work, be part of writing groups, so they go away for weekends to um, to just write on their on their research. Who also get support in developing teaching skills. And, and pedagogy skills, and really just looking out for them uh, and trying to ensure that uh, there aren't unnecessary obstacles thrown in the way. So I would hope that we are that we can and do and do better to nurture such academics. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm reluctant and I'm anxious that we shouldn't get into individual cases. Other academics have written on the social media about their personal stories uh, and and views that they should have been promoted and haven't been promoted. Um, most of those cases I have investigated, and uh, our judgment has been of the prom promotions committee that is concerned, a committee which often has, let's say, a black chair, uh, a number of deans on, I think representatives of transformation committees on those committees, and they've, their judgment has been that the person does not yet meet the standard, will meet the standard, but does not yet do so. And I don't think anyone would want us to drop standards or to make allowances. Uh, for promotion for anyone, white or black. Uh, so there are a lot of white white applicants who don't get promoted um, because they don't meet the standards, and they will. It's often just a question of uh, of time and of accumulating more research under your belt or more teaching experience under your belt. Uh, each case is different, um, but uh, yeah. Because uh, we've just had a, a comment emailed in which speaks about. Um, a white professor who was recently appointed with only a UCT press book and a handful of articles. Um, so that's the opposite then, where someone hasn't had a lot of publications um, and yet has been made professor. And again, you know, I would be happy for you to email. I don't think we should probably not put the name on air because we could, you know, it might, it might uh, not be not respectful of someone's dignity. But I would be happy through you, for example, to, receive, to, to see that email and find out who they're talking about and find out more about what the circumstances are and, and also to get back to you. And you might be able to make a judgment or to say to your listeners, um, you looked at this and you understand the case, but we can't really discuss individuals in public because it becomes about comparing one with another. I would say, though, that um, the, each faculty has its own criteria. For example, in the Faculty of Commerce, where um, there are professionals who are accountants, um, it's quite common for people, it, it was very rare in the past for accountants to do PhDs. And, and, and in the accountancy field, you might be promoted to professor without a PhD, although today it would be very rare, but with a whole lot of, um, if you were seen as, as a leader in the field of accountancy, you run the regulations, you are the experts called uh, when there are difficult problems, you advise the government on, 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 on issues, and you advise SARS. You know, we, we, we might have developed criteria for accountancy or for a bunch of medicine. So if you are the top, you know, cardiologist or, or trauma doctor, and you're the person who everyone would like to have saved their life if they were in a, in a car accident, um, and you are the best teacher, you might be able to be promoted to professor while not being as strong on research. But faculties in the department have specific criteria, and so one must also compare it to other people in the same discipline or in the same department. And I would need to do that in this case. Um, it may not be appropriate to compare that particular professor to someone else in a different department, different faculty, who is where the other where the criteria are different. Um. When we look at this whole situation that's unfolded in the past couple of weeks, it's, you get the impression that management has been on the back foot, um, reacting to events that have been going on. Um, going forward, does management have plans on ways to be proactive about this situation? Um, you have mentioned that there are things that have been happening quietly and slowly in the background over time, and obviously given the, the discussions recently, this hasn't been at the speed that people would like. So are new plans being made? Are there discussions on how to accelerate things further? 
have the events of the recent days actually made management at UCT rethink the way that they've been going about things and how they plan to go about things in future? Um, I think they have, um, but probably one of the lessons or one of the things we've been hearing is a concern that transformation happens on management's terms and that it's not an inclusive process. Have I lost? Are you back? Yeah, I lost. Looked like I lost you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, we uh, and so I think that the starting point is to bring together uh, in in some sort of forum again uh, the people who are 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 feeling passionate about transformation and hear what they think uh, should be done urgently and what they think you know short term, medium term, and longer term interventions. We have ours. I don't think we were sleeping about that. We we have those. Uh, plans and we've been doing things as we talked about earlier and we would continue doing things but I think that uh, maybe we don't we don't publicize it enough it doesn't produce results quickly enough we would like to hear from um, the various groups uh, what they think we should be doing in the short term to accelerate this the one issue which we I think will accelerate is the review of symbols and and names of buildings which we had which we had as I said planned but which I think should can be accelerated and should be Okay. There may be there may be other there may be other activities which I have some personal ideas but um, and I'll put them out there but again I don't want that to be seen as determining the agenda for for a transformation process but for example parts of this university and particularly the health sciences faculty about ten years ago maybe even more 2002 um, conducted their own um, kind of version of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission within the faculty where they said, where they acknowledged that there had been all this hurt that had accumulated over years of apartheid and they wanted to create a public space like a TRC where people could talk about it and where other people would listen to those experiences. Now I understand, I wasn't at UCT then, but I understand that the broader university did not feel that that was something that should be done or needed to be done in the university. Perhaps they felt it was too late that they missed the boat uh, because it was 10 years after 1994. Um, perhaps there wasn't, perhaps there weren't enough people who felt that anger and that, and that they hadn't been heard to express that and that what, one of the things that's changed now is that we now have four students who come and staff who come from that background and who, who want to express that, that, that they feel invisible, that they feel like outsiders, that they feel like they're still around and perhaps this is the time we consider where we should conduct some sort of TFC uh, in a reconciliation a forum uh, where we set some time, we give voice to the people who feel they're in silence and we also expect our others to listen and to hear our people. So it's one idea that I'll put forward uh, as a as, as making a more specific uh, uh, indicate that this is a game changing moment, this is a uh, historic moment that we need to use uh, to accelerate transformation, not just let it pass and lose the energy and lose the momentum. Are we there? I think, I think the internet gods are telling us that it's time to wrap up. Um, okay. But if I manage to catch the end of that, uh, are you saying that there may be a possibility that uh, other parts of the university would take that approach and have sort of a truth and reconciliation style forum? Or that we, or that we are recognizing that at least one part of the university already did that, that the rest of the university should do that as an institution. I, I don't think we would fragment it into different parts of the university. I don't know, I haven't thought through the Okay, I think that is all that the internet gods will allow us for today. Uh, Dr. Max Price, thank you so much for giving us your time and for um, speaking with us today. I know that you're really busy and um, you've given us quite a lot of your time. 
I'm sure that um, a lot of people have lots of things to say about this. If you would like to comment on this, please email us, WhatsApp us, uh, talk to us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and Deadbox will continue to cover the situation as it moves forward. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Price. And thank you. Thanks, Pam. Time for another hangout with the Deadbox. Thank you.